narcissist, and red flags. Red flags are incidents you note, and reference if needed later. Deal breakers is when your boundary has been crossed and you have to walk away. Too many red flags can make a deal breaker. Boundaries have to be as clear as civilian law. The survivor of narcissist abuse is learning to trust their gut again, or for the first time if they are unhealed from narcissist abuse subjected by a parent. The survivor needs to know how to navigate in the world, with a compass that shows red flags when needed, and flashes bright when boundaries are broken. Victims that are under the control of the narcissist, and those that recently escaped, spend time reflecting on what red flags did I miss, or what evil did I do in the world, to endure the raft of the narcissist. No matter what stage you are at, the red flags testify as the same. Crossing boundaries fuels the narcissist, to test your boundaries further. They want to see how many boundaries they can break and how many times they can make you uncomfortable, and to bend their will. This may be the pictures of yourself you send reluctantly on request, the money you spend with a gut feeling that you shouldn't, or imposing on your time by need of favor. The jokes made about you, when they are apparently only teasing, and them not meaning things in the negative way it's implied. These small gaslighting techniques grow over time. These are red flags, and collectively these red flags are deal breakers, but under such a subliminal disguise, they may be hard to identify. Most of us can see in hindsight, how we ignore red flags. A skilled narcissist, one more self-aware, and high on the spectrum, is more delicate with his disguise, so when the boundary is crossed, you simply cannot believe it. The first major boundary broken, is that disagreement that confused you. You know you weren't wrong, but then you were not sure, and it is you who asked for forgiveness. I can only describe this as a ritual. It is the narcissist's first major dose of secure narcissistic supply, that now you have forgiven him for this wrong, and based on the narcissist experience, it is very likely you will now keep coming back for more of their ill-treatment. They hit the jackpot, and so did you, when you were hoovered up after being discarded. The victim by giving liberty to a major violation is now gambling on the success of the relationship. During that ritual you confirm to the narcissist that they are God, and you are prepared to lay your soul on the altar for them. This is the start of the victim becoming addicted to the narcissist, as they keep gambling for the original narcissist from the love bombing phase to return. The collection of red flags were ignored, and a major boundary has been broken down. The victim is at the start of losing their identity if this proceeds. There is chaos in the soul, if it has no laws to adhere to. In the same way there would be anarchy, in society without law. Red flags gathered together in a subtle way is understandably hard for a person to identify. I believe it is through your intuition, and gut feelings that this can be resolved. Tapping into your gut feelings is applicable to all belief systems. Whether you believe in the fall of man, or the illumination of man, both are believers of trusting your internal consciousness for your discernment. There are ways in everyday life to practice your intuition, and more so if you are a parent. That toxic energy that is so often drawn to people that suffer narcissistic abuse, can be tested in everyday life. Can you trust your gut feelings, in your everyday matters of life? It can be as simple as choosing appropriate discipline for your children, and can you spot the red flags in everyday interactions, at work? with friends, and family. Do you have a voice to express yourself in any given situation? Will you tell others when you are uncomfortable? Those of us accustomed to narcissistic abuse, tend to be extremely tolerant, of intolerable behavior. Until you are at least 75% confident in self-expression, I personally believe it is irresponsible to make yourself vulnerable to a love relationship. I do not believe we have to be perfect to be with someone, 
but knowing how to recognize and voice red flags confidently is key, and practicing it in everyday life first, I consider wise. There is a tendency when entering the dating field after narcissistic abuse to obsess about who and who isn't a narcissist. Your quest is not to identify if you are dealing with yet another narcissist. You should not be in their company long enough to ever find out. Obeying a collection of red flags or a deal breaker means you walk away before you ever find out or become trauma bonded if it is a narcissist. Nope. You do not ponder if they are a narcissist, and you certainly do not have several conversations with yourself convincing you everything is alright. You have clear boundaries that you follow, and if broken, by Felicia. So what are these boundaries? Naturally they will come down to the individual's values, but I think we can have some universal boundaries, that are clear deal breakers. Boundary number one. If I feel confused, majorly misunderstood, and I have an urgency to apologize, this is a major red flag. If it happens more than once it is a deal breaker. Boundary number two. I will note red flags in writing, and if I have to justify too many red flags, it is a deal breaker. I did this with a toxic work colleague I personally selected, to be a part of our board of trustees. I started writing down all red flag incidences, and although I justified her actions for far too long, I ended her contract after 10 months. The red flags I noted over time, and justified were as follows. It was titled in my notes as, Jane's, Odd Behaviors. Red flag number one. She was very rude to another colleague, very patronizing and she could potentially change our work dynamic from positive to negative. When Paul made a suggestion, Jane very impatiently said, Well then go for it Paul. I don't believe he noticed but the others certainly did. Red flag number two. Every time I speak with Jane, I get an urgency in my gut, screaming, You should have got references for this woman. Red flag number three. Jane has convinced me to sack two of our trustees. She is now behaving very anxious about me getting this done. She calls too much, and reminds me in every call, and message. It is exhausting. Red flag number four. I wrote a business report, and Jane phoned me. She is furious, and wouldn't stop insulting me about my bad writing skills. She said I am not a good writer and she really made me feel like trash. Red flag number five. I feel so insecure about my writing now, so I decided to write an article about race issues in modern society. I posted it on my personal account online, and she phoned me frantically. Jane asked more than once if I truly had written the article, and where did I learn to write like that? She said it was outstanding and that it did not sound at all like me. Then she said, I wouldn't post it online, think about your image with all that racial talk. Red flag number six. I noted, at a business meeting, Jane kept rudely interrupting, when she didn't have the floor to speak. They were engaging with me more, and it made me feel guilty. I am sure she was angry. She commented after, that artists like me, and those at the meeting, had no business sense, and reminded me she is the writer, and I am the artist. Red flag number seven. Jane woke me up very early today in an anxious state. She claimed she believes we submitted an important form incorrectly. I was sure it was fine. She kept forcing her anxiety on me, made rude comments like, I don't know what you would usually do but this isn't good enough. Within the hour I was able to confirm it was all fine, and she didn't apologize. I still somehow felt that it was my wrongdoing. Red flag number eight. Today Jane asked me to do a report. Just before sending it she sent me hers. I said, but I spent all day on this because you asked me to do this. Jane said she doesn't remember asking me, dismissed it 
and reminded me of all the work she has done so far for us all. Reminding me of her contributions has become an ongoing theme. Red flag number 9. Why can I always sense Jane's moodiness, and I feel like I am in trouble? I do not know if it's my sensitivity, or she reveals too much of her emotions. Red flag number 10. Jane got a huge contract, and instantly has become arrogant. She is behaving like we all work for her. Red flag number 11. I can't believe it, today Jane was so rude to me, and commented, I know you were hoping to pocket most of the money. I am so confused, why would she think this, she is the first trustee to be paid in over five years. Red flag number 12. She praises the work I do, and then laughs about how much heavy lifting is involved. She says, I could never do that, mockingly. Red flag number 13. For every project we do, Jane keeps asking the same questions over, and over again. I thought this was her working style, but it's exhausting, disheartening, and undermining over time. Red flag number 14. Why does Jane consult with no one when she makes business decisions, and spends the charity's money? She is also very territorial as a project manager, and keeps reminding everyone she is the project manager. One of our volunteers is not happy she messaged them a lot of questions, they felt it was done in secret, but it was regarding our projects, so I didn't see the problem. When I asked Jane about it, she was dismissive, and very annoyed so I let it go. Red flag number 15. Today we were all having a laugh in our WhatsApp group. Jane was laughing, then out of nowhere got very serious, and told us to get serious too, it had an undertone that we are unprofessional. Red flag number 16. I notice I never make suggestions to Jane, for some reason I always feel afraid. Today I made a suggestion, and she rolled her eyes, and accused me of being a flimsy thinker. One of our volunteers heard. They said I sounded as if I was being bullied. Our volunteer also said Jane makes him feel uneasy. Another two volunteers later said they would rather not work with her. Red flag number 17. Jane is always accusing me of having a big mouth and now I am very paranoid, when speaking to other work colleagues. Red flag number 18. Jane phoned me furious today. She thought we set up a project without her knowing. I don't know why she thought this. Red flag number 19. Jane made me take a personality test to prove I am unorganized, and that I am an extrovert with a big ego. This is not who I am at all and when the test didn't agree with her, she got angry, she gave me jargon about her experience with personality tests, dismissed me, and said I was wrong. Red flag number 20. For the first time I feel insecure about my work, and ability to do it. Jane speaks of my businesses of 10 years as being very small. She insists I invest it all in her, and her ability to make us millions. She talks about us making millions all the time. Jane is making steps for our new business venture, based around my work. I have not agreed to do this. Red flag number 21. Jane comments way too much on my personal life, and who I date. She is forever warning me about many things in the big bad world, because she apparently cares so much for me. I opened a new business since we are in lockdown, and cannot operate. Jane seems so angry about my new business, and said I was taking on too much. The others from our team congratulated my entrepreneurial spirit. I feel an urgency to prove to Jane, I am a good businesswoman, despite having a successful business for 10 years. Red flag number 22. Jane has joined a new charity and will not stop bragging about her charitable works. Jane is trying to get the charity's director, of over 20 years, 
to stand down, because she said she would do a better job. She said they are all old and easy to scare. I also can't forget I recently learned her last workplace involved her being taken to court, and she lost the case, she hasn't shared the details, and I know feels hard done by that situation. It concerns me. I believe this, along with the collection of red flags is the deal breaker. I had a long list of Jane's red flags over ten months. I even remember other incidents, on reflection, in the very early stages. For example Jane was helpful, and uplifted my life with different networks and courses. She made me open new media accounts to share my work experience, and I remember the first time I did that, she called me very early frantically. Take it down, she said, look at all those grammatical errors. I laughed it off because I didn't know her well, but it did feel wrong in my gut. I didn't think nothing of it the following day, when she showed me a woman from my field of work, and implied she is better than me, and said I should aspire to be like the woman she had selected to triangulate me with. Without the list of red flags I had made, it would have been a blur, and very easy to keep justifying Jane's behavior, especially because she is very good at her job, and the space between each incident was sufficient enough to forget the last. We also had a lot of fun together, and I now realize all the lunches, and business trips was her love bombing me to take control of me. She isolated me from my other work colleagues, and acted as if we had so many things in common together. I was fresh in my knowledge about narcissism at this time. I shared all this with Jane, and about my narcissistic mother. She claimed to have a narcissistic mother too. Jane claimed to be knowledgeable about narcissistic abuse, so I was surprised when she had never heard the term flying monkey. She insisted she had a great book on narcissism that I must read, she was always promising to borrow me this book, but I never received it. Right before I terminated her contract, I told Jane our relationship had made me feel uncomfortable to share business information with our colleagues, and that it all feels too secretive. Jane burst into tears, said I hurt her feelings, and went on and on, about how much she has done for me, she hanged the phone up on me in tears. It was truly crazy, and I went no contact soon after. I removed her from our board taking legal steps. Jane to this day continues to smear my name. I would hope that in the future I would recognize a toxic person by red flag number three, as I entertained her for far too long. Boundary number three. If you ask me to borrow money, while we are getting to know each other, this is a deal breaker. Boundary number four. If you cancel on me more than once, or late for a date more than once, this is a deal breaker. Boundary number five. If something you do hurts my feelings, and you refuse to acknowledge this in a serious way, this is a deal breaker. There is leniency on this if it is a topic often misunderstood, and lacks awareness, however at some point, you should at the least respect my feelings on the matter. Boundary number six. If you treat people disrespectful in public, and you have no connection with them, it is a deal breaker. Boundary number seven. If you become sexual in the first few weeks, mention marriage or anything superficial, and proceed when I have asked you to stop, this is a deal breaker. Boundary number eight. If I feel pressured in any way to bend to your will, and you appear fine with this, and I have voiced how I feel about it, it is a deal breaker. Boundary number 9. Shouting, and bad language is unacceptable, and is a deal breaker. If this happens later in the relationship, I will articulate only one time, that this is an unacceptable way to communicate. Should it happen again, it is a deal breaker. Individually we can develop our own set of boundaries. The point is to stick with them like law. The purpose of the law, is for safety, and it is to be upheld for honor, and integrity.
This is why there can be scenarios where a criminal goes free because of a stipulation made in the law. It is still important to uphold the law in these incidences to guarantee structure for future cases and so the majority of people get justice. The law stops emotion coming into play and it is strictly logic. So if the narcissist has been adorable for 10 months, but then cancels two dates on you, then by your law, they are the one who is now cancelled. The logic of the law will keep you safe. I know we are not robots, but a healthy mind can adhere to this. With the law in place you will not subject yourself to delusions. You will take your time to get to know a person as you are governed by a law that could make them dismissed fairly easily, and you will be monitoring. Your boundaries is your guide, for acceptable behavior, and to ensure equality is in your relationships. You know these boundaries have been crossed if you experience verbal abuse, after all how did we get here, it was permitted somewhere along the line. If you are walking on eggshells, often feeling confused insecure about the relationship, getting the silent treatment, etc. These are not stages it should get to. These are all boundaries that have been broken, and the green light has been given to the narcissist to proceed with bad treatment. Narcissistic abuse is an addiction, and like an addiction it creeps in and increases over time. It is crucial to follow logic and not emotions once you are on the cycle of abuse and drunk on the narcissist. When dating after narcissistic abuse we must verbalize our boundaries clearly, and stick to them like law. Use your experience, logic, and gut feelings. Do not argue with the tally of red flags, or boundaries crossed. Justify nothing based on your emotions and instead honor your law, and the boundaries you created for yourself to direct your decisions, and to keep your heart, safe from evil.